to uh, the Disruptive Diner. Uh, it's August 20th, 2013, and our topic today is the gist of GIS. And we're going to have three speakers that are going to dive into uh, GIS. And uh, as you know, we do three presentations. We want to have great discussion, so we'll have some discussion in between. Um, we record these. Uh, this particular one is not streaming live, but normally these stream live. Our members can watch at home so they don't have to come in if they don't want to, if they're too busy and or if they're out of town or whatever. Um, but we're not doing that today, but they'll be able to watch it. But I want to just kind of introduce a little bit about GIS. So I started this because I was, uh, somebody told me, you know, we have a ton of GIS people in this area. And I didn't know what that was. I mean, I knew it stood for Geographic Information Systems. And I really thought that GIS was like somewhere you could go to a shelf at, at Best Buy or whatever and buy GIS and <laughs> install it on your computer. And, and the reality is that GIS is actually, that's like saying you can go buy IT on, and put it on your computer. Uh, GIS is really a, a, just a way of thinking about the world. And as we talked to people, what we discovered was that there's this incredible thing going on um, that happens to be centered in the area that we're in. Um, some people doing some amazing things because of some defense work. So down a few miles from there's a lot of people that do a lot of defense mapping stuff and have done it since World War II with, you know, how do you keep track of, you know, where everything is in the world when you need to, when you're worried about security. But that same thing is extended to a lot of other um, different ways of looking at it. And what's happened over time, um, you know, because of Moore's Law and some things about openness and network effects, what's happened is that people started wanting to be able to look at space and document it virtually, and, and once they started doing that, it became a good idea to then have a shared shared look at it, to have a shared approach to it. And um, we talked to a guy who is a, is a guy who, uh, at Washington University, he runs a cave lab, which is screens on all the walls and ceilings, and he takes data from places like Mars, and all of this data that they get, and they put it in there, and it's actually a virtual environment, so they can say, here's the rover on Mars. Let's get 50 feet above the crater so we can see really where we want to go to get a different perspective. Mm -hmm. And mapping caves um, to find out why there's a, just like there's a problem with the bees, there's a problem with bats, where, the, where bats um, are disappearing, these big flocks of bats are disappearing and nobody knows why. And those, that's really important to us. I mean, we think bats is like, that's vampires and mm -hmm. Dracula and everything, but they do a huge job to get rid of mosquitoes, so it's actually a big public health issue to not have bat colonies. And pollinate. And pollinate, they do a lot of pollination, right? Nighttime time pollination. And so what they do is they actually collect all of these data points in caves and then find out, oh, the bats that lived in this cool, dry area are thriving, and the bats that live in this moist area um, aren't doing so well. And so, we have, and, uh, so he actually uh, is in a cave that's never been explored before in the Yucatan, so he's not here today because he's actually going, he's a, he, does, he does this cave environment, and then he's actually a caver, <laughs> and he collects all of this data. And all of this data is being used to create a way for people to collaborate around problems. And we had a big aha moment, Jake and I, as we were developing this, where we realized that what GIS is about is not about a piece of software. You can't patent GIS, you can't hold a monopoly on it. But instead what's going on is it used to be that for you to do anything with a piece of real estate, in a, at a moment in time, you had to own it at that moment in time, or rent it or whatever. You could invite people there, and you could build something on it, or you could do whatever. The GIS systems, the, that whole approach allows you to actually collaborate around a place that you don't own, and have a conversation with people about a place, share what's in common about it. Where is it really? What are the real qualities about it? Where is it in that time and everything? Whether you own it or not. So you, it's, it's really a collaborative technology. And um, we're going to see three presentations that are going to address why that collaboration, you know, what that kind of looks like. And um, we're going to move through what that collaboration looks like and then why that's of value to individuals, too, to both solve problems if you're a consumer, but also solve problems if you're an entrepreneur or if you're in a community of entrepreneurs. But I think it's important for us to, as we think about this, to just put that lens on and think about why is this about really having a dialogue about a place and why is that important? And it's important because our world is way bigger than we can experience on any given day. And it's way richer. So I think it's going to be very exciting. You're going to get three takes on it from some very bright people. Um, their presentations will be shared um, with you. And so don't feel like you have to take notes on all of them. Um, and these videos will be posted after the fact. But first, we're going to hear from Aaron Barbara. 
Okay. Aaron, come on up. Thank you. So Aaron is the assistant director, as you can see, for the Center for Applied Research in Environmental Systems, uh, which is in Columbia uh, at the University of Missouri. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, but she also does some projects that are with groups away from the University of Missouri. She's got a really interesting story to tell about how to build community-wide collaboration around this and how they build some products that way that serve other people. So I'm gonna, the format, if you don't know, is we've asked them all to follow the Pachachacha format, which is 20 slides, 20 seconds each. Um, that probably means that we're supposed to start the presentation. <laughs> um, um, so you get 20 slides, 20 seconds each, and the reason we do that is not to be tortured to them, um, but to make them kind of have a point of view that's easy to understand, that we can have a great discussion around, but that we're not asking them to be exhaustive about it. So they're gonna introduce you to a topic have some energy about it, maybe be a little bit panicked about the space that's like that's like that's okay, just go with them. But the important thing is that you learn enough about their point of view to have a great discussion in this finish. Okay? So, Erin, I'm gonna introduce I'm gonna put your slide up in okay. a second to tell us a little bit about yourself. Okay, thank you. So um as Dan mentioned, my name is Erin Barbro, and I'm Assistant Director at the Center for Applied Research in Environmental Systems, or CARES, at the University of Missouri. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we've used maps and data, and we see that they're a really important communication tool. But I'm really going to spend most of the time talking about how we've realized that there are just one small part of collaboration tools, and sort of how we've used those tools in conjunction with collaborative and engagement tools in order to create change for communities. And that's any kind of change that a community wants to seek. We try to support that. So I'll go ahead and get started. So I'm going to begin with why maps and why we think maps are an important communication tool. Maps really are um, a great way to organize complex information. I think we all recognize that. They put information into context, and they really invite inspection, analysis, and critical thinking. They also really apply to many of us who are visual learners. So I want to take a moment to walk through a couple different ways to present a single concept to illustrate this point. What you see here is an article from Working Mother magazine describing the lack of paid maternity leave in the United States. This is a very um, full narrative, but it really is designed for individual analysis and review. Likewise, we can take a look at a table of information. This presents the same information, all of the nations in the country, or all of the nations in the world as rows, with lots and lots of great detail. Again, you really have to dive in and spend some time analyzing this. And I don't really think it would work well in a group setting in order to spark conversation and dialogue. Finally, we can take a look at a map presenting the same point. So very quickly, that same point is illustrated on the screen. And I think in a group setting, many individuals would come to some conclusions. This map is really great because it puts the information into context. You can see that the United States has no paid maternity leave, and it's more interesting when looking at it with respect to the rest of the world. So let's take a look at another map. This is a map of St. Louis, and it shows the predominant race and ethnicity throughout the community. Areas in green represent the African American population, areas in blue represent the white population, and in orange, predominantly Hispanic population. I'm going to shrink this map and move it to the left, and we're going to take a look at that same map compared with high school um, graduation rates. So what you see are areas in darker shades indicate a higher percent of the population without a high school diploma. Uh-oh. <laughs> so areas in darker shades indicate a higher percent of population without a high school diploma. Then we're going to take a look at that same map on the left, looking at race, and we're going to compare it with families in poverty. So again, the darker shades indicate a higher percentage of population of families living in poverty. So what we've done here in just a, literally a minute is taken a look at several incredibly complex, incredibly nuanced, and potentially um, complicated um, issues within a community. And we could do this in St. Louis, we could do this in Atlanta, Kansas City, anywhere across the country. And what this does is really tickles different parts of the brain, and I think really sets a nice stage for moving forward in terms of problem solving and discussion and collaborative change. Another great thing I like about maps is that they have a Switzerland, if you will, or neutral space they can occupy within a group. I like the way that they cause individuals to lean in in order to examine the information. I like the way that they provide a path forward to problem solving. 
And they can allow collaborations to ask very low risk what if scenarios. What if we looked at these different types of data? So I'm with the Center for Applied Research and Environmental System, and we've been observing these trends in looking at maps and data for over 20 years. Our mission is to make public data publicly accessible and easy to use and understand for all. And we have a number of clients that we work with, including the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, we work with the Smithsonian, uh, the Kellogg Foundation, um, the Public Health Institute, a number of groups around the country. And why they come to us is because they want to take advantage of our core GIS data engine. We collect thousands and thousands of GIS data layers from publicly available sources around the country. Um, and we maintain those on a regular basis. We make that data available through an interactive mapping um, platform that's available on the web, no, a number of them indeed. And we also have a um, custom data analysis and custom cartography component that we develop for individuals. We also have very innovative local data integration tools where local community members can draw areas, drop points, and draw lines on a map. And we have a content management system where they can save those maps and reports, data, documents, and files, and collaborate and discuss around them. One project I'd really like to discuss is this one. This is where we brought th many thought leaders from around the country, not thousands, a lot of individuals to help us think about the two key indicators that relate to poor health outcomes. And these folks identified um, low educational attainment and high poverty as the two indicators that we could overlay and identify in areas in red the most vulnerable in our community. So we, I hope, I hope I've laid the foundation that maps and data can be a nice communication tool, but is it enough for collaboration? And we really don't think so. Uh, we think it's an important piece, but our organization and the partners that we've worked with have over the past couple of years begun to invest equal amounts of energy in building that GIS data engine core, but also building a number of engagement and collaboration tools around it. That includes blogs, social media, um, reports, collaborative group spaces, et cetera. And what this has manifested itself into is something called the Community Commons. So Community Commons was launched in 2011. We have about 6,000 users across the country who represent community change agents within um, that space. Um, they have access to free maps and GIS and collaboration tools. Um, and we recently redesigned the site, actually, a couple of months ago, based on 1,000 of our users um, filling out and, and working with us through interviews and a survey. So we're excited about the future. So we really believe in the power and the communicative power of maps, but we also believe in the power of a story. And so putting those maps in the context of a story for meaningful engagement is the direction that we're going to be moving. And we are really excited about what's coming in the next couple of years as more communities join the commons and use maps and data to create real positive change in their communities. Thank you. Now you brought up, you, know, you told a great story about you know, the power of place and everything. And it reminded me, you, you had the picture up there of the apple a day thing, you know. Mm -hmm. um, do, do, does anybody know that Johnny Appleseed was actually a real estate speculator? <laughs> do you guys know this story? No. So Johnny Appleseed was actually a person, real person, um, that got the nickname Johnny Appleseed, but he actually went around and seeded apple orchards, not for apples like we eat. So we have to forget the apple a day kind of thing that we have. That's only really been in the, in the 20th century that apples were that way. But before that, apple varieties were frequently bitter, they were, and they were raised to either produce uh, vinegar or cider. And what you needed was, vinegar was an important industrial chemical in the agricultural age that you mm. used for a lot of processing, a lot of pickling and things. So he actually went around, and where likely things, where likely communities could be started, he actually seeded apple orchards left them because he wouldn't have to do anything for these cider apples and could go away. And he could come back years later and know that he could have a cider mill in that town. Mm -hmm. And um, so location mm -hmm. and food and those kind of things, you know, we think that the, oh, this is a really interesting kind of different way of thinking about space. It's not that really, I mean, we <laughs> about having, you know, shiny boxes and things. Right. So anyway, so that's a long-winded story, but I just thought it was kind of interesting about what you're talking about. So talk, of, you know, um, and, and Libby, you're working on a project that's, you know, doing some collaboration on space about wa watersheds. Could you 
you know, then would you agree on what she's saying about collaboration? What have you seen when you talk about people gather people around a map and look at what St. Louis looks like from that perspective? Well, um, I'm a visual person, mm -hmm. um, but I still have problems with maps. Mm -hmm. So sometimes there's too much data. Mm -hmm. and, um, right. So uh, I really like what you're showing us here, where they're somewhat abstracted. Mm -hmm. um, but I would love to be able to layer highways or, or right. add s streets and then take them away. So right. That so the I can get completely oriented. Right. Where that orange blotch was. Right. So the 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 screenshots that I showed were actually taken from the Community Commons, which is a free interactive mapping tool. And so you can go in and create those maps and overlay. We have, like I said, lots of different data layers. So you can add in highways, take them off, add water. You can add um, the satellite imagery behind it, um, hospitals, schools. There's any number of different data layers that you can add. So. For the purposes of this presentation, they were screenshots, but yeah, definitely it's an interactive mapping tool. Have you all seen what you can do on, um, so Esri, which is a company that does huge uh, data uh, geographic systems for government and big enterprises, and they're actually starting to realize that they need to serve the average consumer. It's a lot of collaboration. The more data is in the system, the more valuable their system becomes. So they just started doing this thing um, where they've got now the ability to tell your own story mm -hmm. via maps. And if you use your camera on your phone to take pictures of your vacation and put all the images into Flickr, it will automatically build a slideshow and a route of where you went on your vacation. That's so cool. Uh, because your mm -hmm. camera captures data on where you put on the location of where you're doing this. So you can create your own map that's got all of the pictures of here's what happened on which days. Yep. Uh, so there's some really interesting things that are happening from very unlikely people mm -hmm. thinking about collaboration. Mm -hmm. Yes, you don't even have to sign on to use Community the maps. Commons, right? Community Commons, yes, sorry. Uh, common common mistake there, but uh, so so yes, just go to communitycommons.org and you can go to maps and data and start creating maps and reports, um, and the only time you need to sign on is if you wanted to save anything. So it's a free registration, though, to sign up. Mm -hmm. um, I was just wondering, where does a lot of the data come from? I see some examples, do you allow So we do, we have, that's kind of where our, our work with our partners and how we fund the free piece comes in. So what's available for free is the access to all the public data. And then we work with partners as the sort of the client list that I mentioned there and they will sort of set up a system that they make then available to all of their grantees or all of their members that, where they can integrate local data. And we are trying to explore some ways that we could do some smaller, more discrete data integration at a lower cost for more people and we're just beginning to explore that, but yeah. Uh -huh. This would seem like a natural tool for anybody who's in real estate development or commercial real estate. Are they adapting? Yeah, well, so this, um, our, our national interactive web page was actually, or web platform, was uh, we began like in the early 90s creating something called the Missouri Map Room. And it was something that CARES did. We had a lot of projects we worked on um, that were funded projects. And then we would put the data that we would collect for funded project in this Missouri Map Room. And it was free and it was available for anyone to use. And we have a ton of real estate and other folks using it. They're always the first ones to call us when it's down or you know there's any problem there. And it was not our expected audience, but yes, definitely. Um, assessors, you know, like, yeah, we have a lot of folks using it. I don't know about the national site. Uh, we're not collecting, you know, as much information there in terms of users, so. Um, I think it would be a great format for citizen science projects. Do you get a lot of citizen science groups using your data? Um, I, I, I'm not sure. We have had a lot of um, inquiries from educators from, um, we've had a couple people use it in terms of um, like a class project, you know, letting us know that they're going to have 100 people coming on and, and using the site probably at the last minute, <laughs> you know, the night before the project's due. So be prepared. Um, so, so, but specifically to that end, I don't know. Um, there are some, if you go to our website, um, we did a, a webcast I believe late 2012 with Shannon Donegan from Public Laboratory, and they actually do citizen science, um, and, and they um, they call it public science actually. That it's mm. not, you know they're like it should be not just citizens doing it, but it should be for the public. But they did it 
during the BP oil spill to map the beaches mm. to challenge the, the, what they saw as the um, rosy glasses data that was coming out right. of that. Um, there's a really great example of what they've done with some very low tech, very accessible stuff. And even finding polluters in, in some neighborhoods and getting them prosecuted. Um, there, there's a great example of the kind of collaboration that touches a little bit on real estate, but also touches on what you talked about. Um, one of the friends of ours, uh, Christian Clark, who sometimes comes to some of these events and wasn't able to today, he did a project uh, for a local homeless shelter that had a small block grant, and they had to figure out um, for $10,000 they could have a grant to spend on something for street improvements to improve public safety for their, their, um, their constituents that were coming to and from their shelter. And so what they did was they actually did a huge map of the routes that all these people traveled mm. and um, brought it in, looked at it all in Google Maps and looked at their routes and figured out the two city blocks that all that 90% of their clientele traveled wow. and put the, wrote the grant to improve those two city blocks. And the, the granting agency was so impressed with that work that they said, well, we'd like to give you more money so because it's clear that you're putting the money where it's going to make the most difference. So That's great. People are doing mm -hmm. this, you know, Walmart and people like that, they are using these geosystems, but they're on a proprietary basis. They have a lot of filters mm -hmm. that they use to know um, when a store is valuable in a neighborhood and how much the real estate is worth. And, um, and some people are actually doing flipping of houses are actually using it, but they use it to look at auction sites and actually go out and find the sites that they need to look at. So if, they don't, if they're flipping, they don't have to go look at 100 properties. They can just look at one lot. Right. And Matt, you're going to talk a little bit. Matt Kulig is going to talk a little bit at the end. Uh, he's our last presenter. He's going to talk a little bit about retail and commercial and how location is being used there. But we're going to have to take a slight break. And then when we come back, Andrew Couch from Candy Lab is going to talk to us. And, and Candy Lab does um, mobile and websites and things like that. But especially he's going to talk about augmented reality and what happens when you um, add rich media to place and how rich the storytelling can be and how immersive that can be, especially if you're going to find it. So, Great. Um, have a few minutes to discuss amongst yourselves.